this is GIP 18A, part two of the pictorial printing in China lecture. It was preceded by a preface uh, on other materials and techniques related but separable from pictorial printing. So now we go on to the main body. Before continuing, however, to show and talk about Chinese pictorial color prints that are the main subject of this lecture, I'll say a few words about what I take to be my large ideas or arguments behind undertaking the subject. And by large, I certainly don't mean correct. They aren't the kind of ideas that are either right or wrong. I just mean sweeping ideas, all embracing ideas. First image, please. The first large idea I've introduced already in the postlude to our first series, the Pure and Remote View Lectures. It's the one about how the Chinese seem to have a grand cultural tendency to invent or introduce some practice, carry it to the highest point it's ever going to be carried anywhere, and then stop doing it as if by some great collective decision. Examples that I gave included the failure of Chinese artists to really carry on the great ink monochrome landscape tradition that had been built up in the Southern Sung Academy in Chan painting, the exploration of the world by sea, that is Zhang He's voyages, and the development, but not the following up, of a proto-science that set China ahead of the rest of the world while it was going on. This is the so-called Needham problem. To those examples could be added, I think, the practice of pictorial color printing by the multiple block method. The Chinese develop it in the late Ming period, producing examples, as we'll see, that are seldom to be rivaled and perhaps never equaled in any other time or place. They carry this on into the early Qing period, and then they more or less stop developing it, although they do some fine and interesting color prints afterwards. So it's the Japanese who take up this art from the Chinese and carry it on into the ukiyo-e production of color prints that everybody knows about, as well as the printed picture book called Gafu that will be the main subjects of the companion lecture to this one, GIP 18b. Whether or not I'm right in stating the matter in this way is open to question. I had a correspondence with four learned colleagues about this matter in 2008, and it's accessible on my website under Writings of James Cahill. The other big idea that I set forth on the same send-out to colleagues is this, and I'll underlie the discussions that follow, both in this lecture and in the one on Japanese gofu. And again, I quote from that send-out, quote, I want to lay out some ideas about how the development of color printing in China and Japan can be understood in terms of intermedia moves, one medium imitating another for a time, then gradually becoming independent, developing techniques peculiar or idiomatic to that medium. A simple idea, but it needs some elaboration to be understood." End quote. Chinese pictorial printing in ink starts out by reproducing, as best it can, linear ink drawings by hand and the only kind it has the capacity to reproduce at that early stage, and only later opens up into a separate medium with its own techniques and characteristics. There is no real equivalent in painting, for instance, judging at least from what we know and is preserved, for the great achievements of pictorial ink printing as carried on during the late Ming in Anhui and Nanjing, notably by block cutters and printers of the Huang family in Anhui. It transcends, that is, the character of a means of reproducing painting. My essay continued with a series of bibliographical notes for publications on woodblock color printing in China. I will attach that as a bibliography for this lecture that will be available through the Institute for East Asian Studies and my website. On the subject of books, however, let me just begin by giving credit to an early and basic study. Next, please. The Invention of Printing in China and Its Spread Westward by Thomas Francis Carter, New York, Columbia University Press, 1925. This is a very important statement of a large truth. That is, the printing was invented in China and practiced only later elsewhere. Gutenberg and the others were latecomers in that sense. Now at last, on to the main matter of this lecture, that is, woodblock color printing in China. Next. In one of my... PRV lectures, I showed this printed picture as an example of uh, representations of Taoist paradises, identifying it as after a design by the late Ming artist Ding Yunpeng. It's from a late Ming book published by a famous Anhui ink maker, surnamed Cheng, and the book titled Chengzhi Moyuan, or Cheng Family Garden of Ink, 
reproduces in woodblock pictures the designs that he commissioned for his ink cakes, some of them from famous artists of the time, along with appreciative poems. In the preface to this lecture, I showed photos of a workshop making ink cakes, so you know what they are. The Chengshir Moyuan was published first in 1605, or possibly 1604. There are several editions and some questions about dating. A woman scholar named Li Jiang Lin, whom I don't know, wrote a dissertation for Princeton in 1998 on this book, and another published by a rival ink maker named Fang, the Fang Shi Mopu, or the Fang, Fang Family Ink Album. Next. And here is a double page image from the Cheng Shi Moyuan. Most copies of the book were printed in ink only, but in a smaller number of luxury copies, perhaps made for presentation to important people, a few of the designs are printed with some color by what Søren Edgren calls the relatively primitive method of applying colors instead of ink to some parts of the block. Different colors could be applied to different areas of the block, that is, and more than one impression taken, but Edgren believes that the printing was sometimes done by applying colors to the block all at once and taking a single impression, and the way the colors can be seen to run together in the print seemed to confirm that. Next. Of course, we don't have the original carved wood block from which the book or any other late Ming book was printed, but this will serve as a stand-in. It's a wood block with a picture and text that apparently was never used or only inked once for a proof. It's in the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris. We imagine a block of this kind placed face up on the table, unlike our printing, which is typically done with the block inked and placed face down in the press. It was then inked, that is, the ink spread over it, and the paper laid over it and rubbed on the back with some kind of urine. So you can see how easy it would be to put colored pigments on some parts of the block instead of ink. And that appears to be the real origins of color printing in China. Next. Here's one of the picture prints alone, uh, larger, so you can see it better. It's easy to imagine seeing this, how the ink and colors could be put on different areas of the block to make these colored versions of the print. This one is from a copy in our East Asian Library, taken from a book published by Deborah Rudolph of their staff. Next. A landscape with a cluster of buildings, distant trees, and clouds. I copy these from reproductions in books. I haven't seen enough of these colored prints myself to make original slides from them. The woman who wrote the dissertation on them at Princeton apparently traveled all over to see the different copies. Next. Some kind of scholarly gathering under bamboo. The limitations of this kind of printing are clear, but it does bring the printed image closer to a painted one, and it gives these luxury copies of the book the distinction of being individually made and in small numbers. Next. This one titled, Boating on the Broad River, depicts a scene of that. Scholars composed poems to match the subjects of the ink cake designs, and these were printed on the opposite pages. Next. Finally, these two, particularly rich in color, representing a dragon in the clouds and phoenixes and bamboo. I'm not identifying collections or sources because those are all given in the essay on my website. In reading discussions of the technique used in making these, you'll find different views, as I say, those who think the colors were applied to the block successively and the paper put over it and rubbed over and over, or Soren Edgren's view that the colors were all applied at once to the block and a single uh, impression made. Bolstering the latter view are some overlappings and, and runnings together of the colors. Okay, I'm going to stop. Okay, continuing. Next, please. The next step was to make separate blocks for the different colors and use them to print the colors, one after another, onto the piece of paper. And this is the technique used for the rest of the history of woodblock color printing in China and Japan. I've watched it being done at Rungbao Chai, the big sales outlet for prints and paintings, located on Liu Li Chang in Beijing. And both our delegations in 1973 and 1977 were taken to printing establishments to watch demonstrations of it. This diagram shows the basic mechanism, a table with a slot with multiple sheets of paper hanging down in it. And these are pulled up one by one and placed over the block and imprinted with that color, and so on, through multiple colors. In the late Ming books, there are only a few colors used, three or four typically. 
But as time goes on, more and more blocks are used and new techniques developed for printing that isn't just colored line. Next. It isn't easy to establish priority among the color woodblock pictorial printings of the late Ming for this multi-block process, but one of the Shibui erotic books, which I'll talk about later, is a group titled Feng Liu Zhui Chang Tu, with a preface dated 1606, is a strong candidate. One writer on it dates the publication of uh, dates of that year, but Saren Edgren questions the dates of both series, and he points out that what we have is likely to be chance survivals from a much larger output that mostly hasn't survived. This is important to recognize. Before the publication of the Ten Bamboo Studio Manual of Painting, the Shurju Jai, which we'll see at greater length, books of this kind were printed in small editions, some of them privately. They had limited circulation and they may survive only in single copies. Next. One important early series of multi block color prints is the set of 12 prints that exists in a single copy in the Bibliothèque Nationale Paris, which was published in the 1992 exhibition catalog, Impression de Chine. The series is titled Hushan Shanghai, Remarkable Views of Mount Hu, and it was published in Hangzhou, 12 color illustrations to some story or series. It's unclear just what they represent. It begins with a general view of the West Lake near Hangzhou, with its famous dikes and bridges, boats and buildings, and background mountains, and it continues with a series of pictures that must belong to a narrative. And I'll show these and speak about them in a very general way. I'm not going to try to follow any narrative because I say we don't know what the narrative is. Here we go. We see the familiar scene of scholars playing Wei Qi, as if in paradise, and people arriving at villas and temples. The series is dated to circa 1620 to 40 by the people in Paris, which is the same period as others will see. You see people arriving at a villa down in the lower part, servants meeting them, the buildings of the villa, uh, people up on the top just standing on some kind of a terrace and gazing out uh, over on the far right, and this one a, a more distant scene, and so on. As I say, we don't know what it is. Yeah, here is one where they're standing on a terrace and gazing out over the West Lake, presumably, and sailboats. No, it may be, oh, it must be the great uh, uh, so-called boar, Hangzhou boar, that comes up the, the river at certain hours of the day. Yeah, here's another print of a uh, hillside with villas, a lot of little people down below arriving, carrying people in sedan chairs, uh, figures all over. Well, it's, it's certainly interesting. We have no idea what, what's going on, as I say. We would like to know. Maybe someday it will be discovered. And here is another closer up scene with a building. We can look inside it. Uh, we see the entrance at the bottom. We see scholars waiting outside a gate while somebody beats on the gate, waiting for people to come in. And up on the top, a constellation of some kind. Printed in several colors, as I say. Again, people arriving at a villa somebody coming to meet them, people and figure. Uh, we'd like to know what, what's going on. And another of the same kind, arriving, people meeting, uh, buildings, uh, landscape masses done in, in blue. This and another series that we'll see later are early examples of the multi-block, as Taoban technique of color printing, in which separate blocks were cut and used for printing each of the several colors. These prints seem to use only three or four colors in each print, and most of the color is in line with flat areas of color, mostly on the costumes, and a simple kind of texturing like the old sun or texture strokes on the earth and rock surfaces. It would be hard to match them up with any paintings of the time and style. They presumably reflect or follow some kind of popular painting that was current then but that hasn't been preserved. The other early example of multi-block color printing is a series called the Jian Xia Ji, or Collection of Scattered Red Clouds, a series of designs for embroideries, some of them showing the shapes of the objects to be embroidered. Embroidery was a major art or craft in China, still carried on in places like Suzhou. This collection was edited by a man named Shan Lin Qi, whose dates are 1603 to 1664. Until recently, this work was known only in a single copy with 16 pictures, owned by the late Wang Feng Lu, or Fred Wang, seen in these photos, a multi-talented man whom I knew very well. He was teaching at Yale when I first knew him, 
and later in his life he became famous as a calligrapher. His 16 leaves from the Jin Shao Ji were published with Søren Edgren's entry in the exhibition catalog A Literati Life in the 20th Century, Wang Feng Yu, artist, scholar, and connoisseur, New York China Institute, 1999. But several years ago, I purchased in Taipei without quite knowing what it was, recognizing only that it was old and important, a hand scroll that proved to be a much more complete Jin Shao Ji, containing no less than 42 prints, with numberings, moreover, going as high as 46, indicating that the original number must have been more than that. The Chinese dealer I bought it from had acquired the remaining stock of the Japanese dealer I most respected, Ida Bungado, from his widow after Ida's death. Uh, here you see Ida and myself uh, would, when I paid a late visit to him. I knew he was quite an old man, but I, for all my time, time in Japan I visited him often. The Wong copy had also been preserved in Japan. The prints in this more complete series are not equal to the Wang Feng Nu prints in clarity of printing or brilliance of color, but they still make up a valuable repertory of late Ming decorative designs. The hand scroll containing these prints was purchased from me by Christopher Vanderberg of the Mubon Foundation in London, and he has plans to publish it. Now I'll show uh, some examples of this and speak briefly about them. Here is a, the, old, the god of old age and uh, a uh, crane which stands for longevity and a pine tree, all the standard thing, and the deer. All of these are auspicious symbols and uh, would be very uh, suitable to an embroidery for something to be given to somebody, wishing them long life and all the rest of it. Here is a scene with, uh, again, auspicious uh, Taoist uh, characters somebody riding a crane in the upper part, as people are supposed to do, riding off to paradise after their supposed death on earth. A, um, a character with a deer down below and lots of women, and uh, an old man, uh, the god of old age it looks like, on a terrace up above, and so on. Here is a print of birds on the branch, uh, looking very much like some, uh, some bird and flower pictures from the paintings from the late Ming. Nothing special about that. Here's I'm showing close-ups of these also that show the quality of the printing. Uh, this must have been multi-block printing with different different blocks for the different colors. Uh, here is a scene of uh, a scholar visiting somebody, uh, and the old woman comes out, and behind her is a beautiful girl. And inside, you can see oh, you can see a, a hanging scroll hanging on the wall, and the servant behind with his luggage. And here it is, close up. Uh, here in a round frame. Uh, well, I'm not quite sure what it is, but anyway, this is a scene from some kind of story. Scholars and beautiful ladies and so forth, and uh, willow tree and the rest of it. So anyway, all, all kinds of popular themes which uh, women of the time would embroider. You can imagine, my God, somebody embroidering all these onto, onto cloth. Uh, anyway, it's a, it's a valuable and interesting example of late Ming color printing, which was not previously known. And here is a picture of two squirrels, okay? And here, the last one, oh, this is the one that is in rather better printed, must be from the Wang Feng Yu copy. Um, uh, some da another Taoist scene, paradise, uh, beautiful ladies coming down on a dragon, a crane flying, a pine tree, all this, I say, very auspicious, uh, tall peaks. The Xi Wang Mu, the, the mother, queen mother of the West. Okay, anyway, these are all subjects that would take a long time to identify and describe. Okay, now let's go on. Another type of color print that's important in this early period is the letter paper or poetry paper with imprinted designs, usually fairly small and printed in the middle of the page. One would buy this kind of imprinted paper and use it for writing poems or notes to send to friends and so forth. These were still for sale when I went to China in the 1970s at the Xilong Yinsha on an island in the West Lake in Hangzhou, for instance, fine woodblock printed designs over which uh, one was supposed to write. I bought some of it, but I never found myself really able to use it. <laughs> I could simply kept it as his prints. The late Ming examples are among the really fine examples of pictorial printing that we have. I should say that Suzanne Wright, who was my student through the master's degree at UC Berkeley, and at Stanford with Vinograd for her doctorate, Suzanne did her dissertation on these and has published several articles on them. 
Next. The um, Lao Shan Bien Gu Jinpu, or the Law Studio Letter Papers that we're seeing here, was published in 1626. It was printed by a certain Wu Fa who born in 1578, and in one study it's claimed to be the first to use multiple block printing process, which, quote, strongly influenced the later Shu Zhu Jai, or the Ten Bamboo Studio series. But some of the erotic books that we'll consider later are at least as early, probably earlier. The whole series constitutes uh, some 128 folded pages. A facsimile publication of these was published by the Shanghai Museum. These, what I'm showing, are I simply took from reproductions, and I'm not going to talk about them individually. Some are landscapes, some are uh, a picture of a horse uh, drinking, a picture of uh, various uh, books and other things. Anyway, auspicious subjects, things that uh, one can use probably in writing the note or the poem that one wrote. Mostly these are from reproductions, as I say, I don't have good original things. Oh, here are two with butterflies and uh, two old people. Now these are from the Churchu Jai Jianpu, um, Ten Bamboo Letter Paper. The other major letter paper series from the late Ming period is the Churchu Jai Jianpu, or Ten Bamboo Studio Letter Papers, which is uh, a series that was published uh, and printed in Nanjing by Hu Zhongnian, in 1644. I can show images from the originals, uh, slides that I made in the Palace Museum in Beijing, when a series of these from their own holdings are on view. Again, they are designs of high sophistication, printed often lightly on paper that was to be used for writing poems and letters. They were produced, as I say, in Nanjing in 1644, at a time when that city was already living under threat from the Manchu invasion which ended the Ming Dynasty and ended with it the great cultural fluorescence of Nanjing in the following year, 1644. The letter papers testify to the level of taste of the people for whom they were intended and to the self-confidence these people must have felt in overlaying their calligraphy and their poetic or epistolatory sentiments upon such exquisite grounds. I'll talk about a few of them. Uh, here is one showing an old man seated, leaning over, uh, with his shoes off. Here is one of a, an herb seller walking along with his herbs over his shoulder. And let's see, then another seated man. Yeah, the old herb seller walking with a patched uh, robe. And uh, here is one of a, a rock, and they were auspicious and pleasant subjects. Here's a quite wonderful one of, of uh, chrysanthemums and rock, recalling, of course, Taoyuan Ming. And here is one of a phoenix, uh, sort of breathing out uh, air. In each case, I show the, uh, the, the uh, whole thing and then the detail. Yeah, and here's another phoenix uh, in the clouds and uh, a picture of a chrysanthemum and blossoming tree and some kind of beast uh, drinking from the water. And uh, anyway, on, on and on, various, various subjects. Quite fine, quite finely printed, lightly printed, and meant to be written over. It's hard to imagine doing it, but that's what they intended anyway. Now we go on to a great series of prints illustrating the Xixiangji, or Romance of the West Chamber. The series of prints was published in 1640 in Nanjing by Min Qiji, a publisher who is also known for other printed works. This series of illustrations exists in a unique copy in the Museum of East Asian Art in Cologne. I saw it many years ago, and again several years ago, when I visited that museum for a few days and made color slides from it with details, which I'll be showing. The images from my slides aren't perfect, but they show a lot more than the printed reproductions that are ordinarily available. The first and the best publication of the album or the series is Edith Dittrich, D-I-T-T-R-I-C-H, Das Westzimmer, Shishang Ji, Chinesisch Farb Holzschnitte von Min Shiji, 1640. The Romance of the West Chamber, Shishang Ji, Chinese Color Woodcuts by Min Shiji. Uh, Cologne Museum for Ostasiatische Kunst, 1977, Museum for East Asian Art. I once found myself sitting next to Edith Dittrich at a conference and reading her name tag, I gave her some praise for her publication. She was very pleased. 
because, as she told me, she wasn't a fully trained scholar herself and hadn't been noticed much by her learned colleagues. There's also an article about it by Dawn Ha Del Banco in Orientations magazine for June 1983. Dawn Ha Del Banco is the daughter of Wygom Ho, and she was a graduate student at Harvard in 1978-79 when I was there as a Norton lecturer, and I was her mentor. Later she married Andrew Del Banco, who has become a noted writer, and I haven't heard much from her. She may have given up scholarship. Too bad. Next, please. The story of the West Chamber, the Xixiangji, is a scholar beauty romance in the form of a drama written by Wang Shifu, 1250 to 1300. There was a great production of it, by the way, presented in parts over several days by a Shanghai company produced in New York some years back. Xinguan and I saw some parts of it. The main characters in the Xixiangji are Zhang Sheng, or Scholar Zhang, a promising student aspiring to become a scholar official, and Cui Yingying, a beautiful maiden, along with her maid Hong Yang, who becomes a major figure in the drama. The two lovers meet in a temple. They fall in love at first sight, and after a series of thwarted attempts, they end up happily marrying each other. After Zhang Sheng, or Scholar Zhang, has passed the civil exam as a uh, top candidate, of course. There are a lot of complexities and difficulties before they arrive at a happy ending, but they don't concern us. Much of the play is set in the gardens and buildings in the rooms of Cui Yingying's home. Now, with that as an introduction, I'll show the prints in order, 1 through 20, and talk about them individually. Here is Xi Xiangji Min, uh, by Min Shiji, print number 1, and is done in the form of a hand scroll. And you can see the rolled part and the, and the title at the right, and then the uh, design itself, and then uh, uh, kind of what looks like a signature and seals that were at the left. And this shows a, a, a long distance scene showing the temple at which they're going to meet before they go there. And it shows them, I guess this is Scholar Zhang down at the bottom, traveling toward the temple. And here is a detail of it. Um, well, I won't talk about the details so much here until we get to some others. This is just a fairly standard, good landscape scene with the temple at the side. The second here. Now this is a kind of glass bowl, like a fish bowl, I guess, and the stand for it behind. And here we see the meeting between the two of them in the garden. Uh, scholar Zhang, his hands in front of him and the, and the girl, and then a garden rock behind, and, a, and then over on the other side you see the bad guy with a beard. I don't remember the story well enough to explain to you just what's going on, but anyway, here are the detail of it. This one is just in black and white, except, of course, the stand behind it is printed in red and a little dog over on the lower right. The third of the Xishangji is butterflies, and it's like a uh, double book page, I guess is what's intended, and very beautiful shaded printing, as you can see, especially in this detail. On, shaded on the leaves and on the wings of the butterfly. You understand this has to be multiple block printing to achieve anything like this. It's highly refined and must have been done only in a few copies. We're very fortunate that even this one managed to survive. The next one is a, uh, I'm not sure what this is, but it's like a diagram with the text running all the way around it and it's set against clouds if it's a a heavenly diagram of some kind. And in this we see presumably Scholar Zhang presenting himself to the old woman who is, uh, who is his love's mother. And uh, uh, anyway, trying to meet her. And this is within the temple. You see a lot of monks over on the side. And a Buddhist sculpture up above at the right and it's all the rest of it. This is in the temple. Uh, and here is the, the detail of it with the uh, figure of the, of the Buddha and two, uh, whatever, I guess, Confucian scholars, something in the sky. I'm not sure what's going on there. And then this next one, which is quite wonderful, this is number five in the uh, series. Here it's a chase, and it's done, it, uh, the represented as the kind of lantern in which uh, you light a candle, and the heat from the candle goes up, and there's a kind of a propeller-like thing up in the upper part, which the heat causes it to turn. And this causes the whole lantern to turn, and it has hanging appendages 
that go around and around. And here the hanging appendages are uh, the, the figure of the people in the, in the chase who are on, on horseback and chasing each other. And down below them you see a, a crab and a fish, so there's water down below them and there's sky up above with birds flying at it. Quite wonderful. All this rendered as if it were a, a part of a, um, of a lantern, one of these uh, turning lanterns. And here you see the, uh, the monk character with his sword raised, and you see uh, others, uh, warrior people on horseback. Okay, next. This is a, like a Chinese bronze, bronze hu vessel, I guess it is. And it's inscribed in ancient characters as if it were an inscription in the bronze. And this is, of course, uh, the heroine of it. And somebody has taken the wood off the bronze, and there she is. She is in color, and the bronze is printed just in green, as it should be for a patinated bronze. Then the next scene, here's uh, the scholar and the lady are meeting, and they're made Hongyang down below. Uh, this is just seen as a, I'm not sure what's intended here, just a, an illustration, perhaps. Uh, it's not a particular type. Yes, here we go. But they're standing on a quite beautiful rug, and uh, various things in it are done, done in great, great detail. And he is, she is handing him a cup of tea or something like that. And here, oh, this is a famous scene, and quite wonderful. This is the scene where she is reading a letter from him. She uh, and the maid, Hong Myung, is, is watching her. And you see the woman in a mirror, which is placed on the table in front of her. You don't see her. She's seated behind the screen, but you see her in the mirror, and you see her reading the, uh, reading the letter. So we are gazing at a mirror, and we are seeing in the mirror the lady, and meanwhile, Hong Yong, the maid, is looking around the screen. It's all very intricate as far as lines of sight and who is seeing what. And meanwhile, you have a landscape painted on the screen, which uh, gives a certain depth with the trees and the waterside uh, pavilion and the fishermen, the standard things. Okay, that's very intricate. Oh, and then there's a wonderful one. This is one in which Sui Yanging and her maid are over at the left on the pavilion of their part of the mansion. And scholar Zhang is over at the right. And uh, they're both gazing into the pond, which is between them. And there's a bridge down below that brings them together. And uh, lily pads, uh, water lily pads on the, on the water and so forth. And a willow tree up above. And of uh, clouds in the distance, etc. Well, what's wonderful is that you don't really see him because he's behind a rock. A large rock rises from the wall. You don't see him, but you do see him in his reflection in the water down below. He's looking over and looking down into the water. She is looking and seeing the reflection and also presumably seeing him. And then down below, below all of that, you see a round white thing, which is the moon in the water. So you put all this together and you have an amazingly intricate, oh, I forgot one thing, his shadow, the shadow of scholar Zhang rising above the wall is shown over at the far right, inside on the floor uh, or on the ground behind him uh, in gray. And you see just his silhouette sticking up over the wall along with some uh, foliage, some kind of plants. Well, you have an amazingly intricate pattern of sight lines and images and things seen and not quite seen, and oh boy, nothing, I mean, it's amazingly sophisticated. Yes, here's the detail with him looking down or seen behind the rock or seen a little bit through the rock. There's a hole in the rock and you see part of his body through it. And you see the moon down on the lower left, as I say. And, uh, oh, it looks as though he's dropped a book or something. No, and I can't see that. Anyway, she's looking down into the water and, uh, Holding a branch, is he? No. The, the blossoming tree is growing behind the wall. And then you see his uh, shadow over on the right. And here she is with her, uh, with uh, Hong Yang behind her, gazing down into the water and seeing him. So they are dreaming of each other, seeing each other. Oh, how intricate and subtle and wonderful can you get? Okay, then we go on to the next one. This is like a pair of jade rings carved so as to be interlocking. This was something that Chinese jade carvers really did, uh, of this uh, sort of gray-green jade. And uh, they are seen inside it, he in his study or his uh, house, the maid fanning the, fi the fire, uh, things to eat or drink. And he is seated on his kong and 
gazing out over, thinking about her, and she is over at the other side being told by her maid, Hung Nyong, something. Okay, the next one, uh, picture 13, here you have a bed with sort of rumpled bedclothes inside and uh, a, a wonderful design of oh, waves and clouds and then on top the a blossoming plum and uh, a uh, stand with a candle and uh, one servant over at the right looking out from behind the thing and Hong Nyong is guarding the thing. They're making love inside. We're having sex under those uh, under those rumpled bedclothes. So this is suggestive for the Chinese and at the same time very subtle. Genuinely erotic pictures were being made also as we'll see but this isn't. And this here is the close-up with uh, Hong Nyong holding her finger up to her lips, the standard thing is saying, shh, quiet, quiet, there. We don't, we don't want to interrupt them. And, uh, oh, there's a translucent, uh, uh, what, hanging over the opening to the bed, and everything beyond it is colored to light blue by this hanging. Wow, how many, as I say, spatial and visual and whatever intricacies can you put into a picture? Uh, then the next one is another lamp and another one that goes round and round, I guess. The old woman, the uh, scholar John, Hong Nyong, and, uh, and the, the maiden, uh, number 11 in the series. And here it is up close. Then the next one, number 15, is in the form of a fan, a fan painting mounted in an album. And it's uh, ink on paper, which means it's just black and white, and it's linear. And it uh, continues the story. I'm not going to try to tell you what's happening, but Scholar Zhang has to go off and get his degree and get various things before he can win her. Now, this is a famous scene. The servant is up in the upper left. Um, this is in the form of a screen, a six-fold screen. And the left side is sort of turned toward us, the left panel, the far left panel, so that we read the inscription on it. And the rest of it is the picture as if painted on the screen, just an ink on paper. And uh, it's the interior of their house and the maid and, uh, and the, uh, the woman and so forth. Okay, then, uh, then the next one, well, this is another of these spatially rather intricate ones. Uh, you see Hong Nyong and her maid in their house through a uh, hanging bamboo blind, which is translucent. You know the sort with fine, uh, fine strips of bamboo where you can still buy them. And uh, then a uh, servant has come on a donkey delivering some kind of letter, presumably, uh, waiting outside. And this is, again, done as if it were a hanging scroll because you see the roller at the bottom and you see the mounting brocade at the sides and you see the tying string up top. So it's a, here is a hanging scroll and here it is up close. She is uh, reading his letter and presumably writing a response to it. Then you have a wonderful one, which is a puppet show. Um, this is number 19 in the series. And I guess that scholar Zhang has come back and is claiming her as his bride and a lot of other people are involved. But at any rate, it's shown as a puppet show. And the two of them are down in the, as the main characters being manipulated by the much larger human beings seen up top along with their servant. And then other puppets representing uh, her mother, representing other characters, are all hanging over at the left, waiting to be used, waiting for their turn on stage, so to speak. Quite wonderful. And here it is up close with uh, yeah, scholar Chong, who's now much rather portly, and now he's become a famous scholar and so on. So he comes back to claim her. I guess that's what's going on here. I'm, I'm not as authoritative as I should be, but I think that's it anyway, and, and shown as a puppet play. And then finally, in the last one, it's just a uh, picture of, of their going off together, I guess, in a boat uh, up to his post, wherever he's posted as a high official personnel. And you have the four animals of the four directions, mythical, uh, tiger, tortoise, uh, dragon, and phoenix. And uh, the, rest, the rest of it is just is like a drawing with uh, uh, printed clouds around it, or maybe an embroidery. I haven't said anything about these much as color prints, but I should end by saying maybe while, uh, maybe while the pictures are shown again, as for the ways in which they are innovated as color prints, it's enough to note that larger color areas, often with designs within them, 
are now possible. A tree leaf can be shaded from dark gray-green at the stem to fade out at the tip, and the garden rocks are shaped with gradations of ink and blue color. The designer, the cutter, and the printer seem here to be pushing further the capacities of the woodblock color print medium, using it in ways that stress its inherent capabilities. Such an achievement makes us lament all the more the disappearance of so much of this art. There must have been quite a few books of this kind produced, and its virtual discontinuance shortly afterwards. As I say, we have only a single copy of this one by good luck. Next, here is a picture of Thomas Ebry, Professor Thomas Ebry, University of Washington, husband of Patricia Ebry, the famous historian of China. Uh, Tom has spent years pursuing the study of the Shurju Jai Shuapu, uh, the Ten Bamboo Studio uh, manual of painting, and the many editions of it. This is his secondary project, really. He's a professor of some kind of biology at the University of Washington, as they say. And he has traveled all over the world to see different editions of this book as he learns about them. He's also collected copies and pages from them, and he plans to publish a book on these. And meanwhile, he's published an essay in the volume from the symposium that followed the British Museum exhibition. I talked about that, I think, in my earlier thing. What I will say about the leaves as I show them will be ill-informed and amateurish. I myself have never studied these books in the way that Tom has, and I can only make amateurish comments on them, which will make Tom wince if he ever watches this. <laughs> but let's get on to look at them anyway. Tom Mabry, good friend, someone I respect very much. Okay, here we go. Now here to begin with are two double leaves from different editions of the Shurju Jai, which uh, I'll, I'll use to represent different editions of the book as I talk about it. Uh, they're copied from the uh, book Impression de Chine by Cohen and Monet, an exhibition of Chinese printing, with examples in the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris. And these are both from copies in their collection. Uh, the Shurju Jai Huapu, uh, Ten Bamboo Studio Painting Manual, was printed and published in Nanjing by Hu Zhongyan, uh, dates 1582 to 1672, and reprinted numerous times, many, many reprints of the Shurju Jai. And you can see, let's see, already in these, the, the different printings, the different periods, differently inked blocks, and so on. The next two, please. Three, actually. I have three pictures of pomegranate to be shown I guess one after another. Another pair of double leaves from two different editions, first of all. These are taken from the exhibition catalog, Les Estampes Chinoises. Uh, these two illustrate the difference between a fine early printing and a later inferior one. Copies of the Ten Bamboo Studio are fairly common, or at least they were when I was collecting books, and I myself have a pretty good edition, but far from being a really early one. For good early ones who have to go to places like the Nelson Atkins Museum in Kansas City, where early copies of these books that Larry Sickman bought can be seen by special appointment, or to museums in Europe and China and the U.S. that treasure them. Well, here you can see, um, the, uh, as I say, how different, how the same block can be differently inked or colored in different periods, and how the the prints, although made from the same block, can be extremely different. Uh, they can be decades or, or even more apart, and um, according to different printers who use the box over and over, and the box also become more and more worn, and from the wearing of the box and various nicks and uh, breaks in them that appear in the later editions, you can uh, get some idea about dating them, and that's the kind of thing that Tom has been doing. Beyond that, um, I'll show a series of leaves without commenting on them much individually. As I say, a few things about the series as a whole. Uh, yes, yeah, so we'll, we'll just look at them one after another uh, freely as, as I talk. The Shurju Jai Shuhuapu, although it was produced by the same publisher as the Shurju Jai Letter Papers in the decade before 1644, is a more extensive work of quite a different character. Uh, the albums that make it up take the same form as painting albums of that time that were devoted to particular types of subjects. And the printing techniques are unabashedly imitative of the techniques of brush painting, 
as if the woodblock medium were being used simply to reproduce, better than any printing techniques had done before, actual paintings by artists of the time, and the signatures and seals of those artists appear on them as further testimony to their authenticity, so to speak. As color print seen in this light, they are splendid. This and the Xixiang Ji illustrations are probably the finest surviving works of Chinese woodblock color printing. Fortunately, the Shiju Jai Shuhuapu survives in many excellent copies with a complex history of reprinting that I won't attempt even to sum up. As I said before, it's a subject of research by Professor Thomas Ebry, who eventually will publish a book on it. The highly developed techniques of cutting and printing are used to reproduce the look of brush painting. Shaded areas of sometimes heavy color are on flower petals and on fruit, an effect achieved by wiping part of the block after applying the pigment to it. Since the block will never be wiped exactly the same way twice, this means that no prints will be exactly alike. One color sometimes shades into another, as in the picture of pomegranates. An effect of textures is produced by light-toned overprinting with a pitted or otherwise fine patterned block. Rough cutting of the blocks for ink outlines or uneven inking of them uh, produces a, a close approximation of contour drawing that resembles closely the same contours drawn with a brush, and so forth. The new techniques are too many and too complex to be described fully. The Shurju Jai Shuwapu prints are, for their purpose, completely successful. But in the grand plan that underlies this in the following lectures, they still stop short of what will be accomplished in Japan, that is, the production of woodblock prints that exploit the special capacities of the medium, not just imitating another medium, painting, very closely. To say that is not to put them down, but to try to fit them within this grand scheme that I'm trying to outline in these two lectures. Next. These are prints of blossoming plum and narcissus and chrysanthemums and other flowers and fruits taken from the Jiuan Huajuan, or Mustard Jean Garden Manual of Painting. Uh, not much is left for the cutters and printers of this to do when they are doing pictures of flowers and fruits because so much great work material, such great printing has been done of these materials in, the, in earlier books. Uh, the great age of innovation in Chinese woodblock color printing, which lasted only a few decades, is pretty much over. But the Mustard Seed Garden Manual proved to be enormously popular. It's by far the most widely reprinted of all the picture collections, with reprints done in Japan and Korea as well as in China. The next. It was produced and published by the famous literateur Li Yu, also known as Li Li Wang, in Nanjing in the early Qing period. The first part of it was in, printed in 1679, drawing on the works of local artists for designs to copy in the prints. Later parts included volumes on such popular subjects as bamboo, orchids, Chinese orchid, lanhua, and the blossoming plum, uh, one of a, s a series on figure painting, and still later, a part that was on portrait painting, which is the first among these albums. The first part of Jade Zhuan, published in 1679, is devoted to landscape, and it was compiled by the contemporary Nanjing landscapist Wang Gai and others active at that time. It opens a new area of subject matter in its landscape prints, which require some expanded applications of the already developed techniques for approximations of brush texture strokes on rocks and mountainsides, for tree foliage patterns, and other components of the new pictorial elements. For these, the J.J. Yuan printers were able to draw on techniques already developed in earlier late Ming instructional painting manuals, a somewhat different category, which, as I stated in my preface, I'm leaving out for our present purposes, but I will show some leaves from one of them later in this lecture. As I noted before, a study of these uh, teaching manuals of the late Ming by my younger colleague J.P. Park has been published. Next. Now I'll show some of the Ding family prints, Sujo prints, formerly called Kempfer prints. We're nearing the end of the really innovative production of pictorial color printing in China, but recent discoveries and reassessments of old museum collections brought to Europe in the 18th century 
have brought about the recognition of a very productive school of printmakers in Suzhou, centering on the Ding family, which produced mainly flower and fruit prints, and also pictures of household treasures of a kind that were meant to stand in for the real treasures that the household maybe couldn't afford. I'll show some of these before concluding with a more extended look at some recently discovered erotic print albums from the late Ming period. The group we're looking at now used to be called the Kempfer series, or the Kempfer prints, after a collector who brought some of them to Europe. The best series of them is in the British Museum, and some of them were included, of course, in the printed image uh, in China exhibition that I've talked about. Next. The same woodblock should be used as before for multiple printings over an extended period of time, often with different colors applied to the blocks. These are three versions of the same picture of chrysanthemums and insects with completely different colorings. One can usually determine the sequence of printings by close examination that will reveal breaks and wear in the blocks, not to be seen in the earliest printings, but increasingly seen in the later ones. The poem, of course, cites the most famous mention of chrysanthemums in Chinese poetry, the ones that the great Tao Qian or Tao Yuan Ming planted along his eastern fence. Every educated Chinese knows about those. And the Chinese love to be reminded of their vast common cultural heritage. I listed my texts, and I have illustrations for them, uh, books that are published still later, 18th, 19th century, even to the early 20th century, but they don't add much of anything to what's already been achieved in the series that we've looked at, and I'm not going to show them or talk about them here. For the purpose of my arguments, the great, the great period of woodblock color printing was over with the Zhejiyuan Huajuan and the early Qing, and some of these prints that I'm showing now. Okay, next. Uh, at least that was true until the British Museum exhibition of 2010, titled The Printed Image in China, organized mainly by Clarissa von Spey exhibited, published, and discussed in that exhibition in its catalog. Catalogs number 24 through 29 are six prints chosen from a group of about 70 that they own that once belonged to a certain Sir Hans Sloan, S-L-O-N-E-E, -E, uh, who died in 1753, so the prints must be earlier than that, early 18th century. They are thought to have been produced in Suzhou, and they testify, like the other prints I've shown, that survive only in single copies, to a very spotty representation that we have of early Chinese pictorial printmaking, chant survivals, that is, out of a huge production. This is unlike the ukiyo-e prints of Japan, which were collected and preserved from a much earlier time. The Chinese literati classes scorn for nearly all popular and lower-level cultural products, saw to it that these, like so much else of Chinese culture that didn't belong to their male minority has been largely lost, that is, through the efforts of the literati. I have somewhat turned against them in my later life. Next, please. Here is, to begin with, a uh, chess player seen within a, um, a pomegranate, uh, to a people playing Wei Qi, that is, shown within a, you know, a large pomegranate, it looks like. Another scene of paradise, in other words. Here's a woman uh, playing with her, to her little child or teaching her little child these are obviously very popular subject, popular prints. Here is a, um, uh, well, it's hard to say what it is. It's a uh, Yang Guifei, maybe, with a eunuch confederate, maybe behind her, Emperor Ming Huang, something like that. And here, this looks like it is maybe Sui Hu stealing the slipper from a uh, another story called The Romance of Peach Blossoms, the Tao Hua Ji. I'm taking these identifications from the uh, from the book, but also from the inscriptions that are written on them. Anyway, a, uh, uh, an interior scene, interesting, with a bed behind and the man, the, the scholar hiding behind the woman who uh, spreads out her skirt to hide him from the servant. Next. And here is uh, Li Bai, or Li Bo, the great Tang poet, writing poems before the emperor on an outdoor terrace. And here is a whole collection of antiquities, uh, household treasures, the type of picture that's common also, as we've seen in other prints, uh, that must have been very popular just for putting on the wall in Chinese houses. And uh, I've, I've shown quite a number of those. Okay, then. I think I will stop there, and that's it for today. And then I'll do another one 
uh, on, on some later stuff, including, including erotic prints. Thank you.